you'll actually have much more resilience while you're engaging the task. But you also have access to higher motivations. That when you have very high self-efficacy, you're more able to shape the why behind what you're doing. Because you're not just trying to survive and get by or like, you know, thinking I'll likely fail. Then it's easy to have the idea of just getting it done. So it, shaping self-efficacy has enormous benefits. So for your, in general, your, your ability to be motivated and to be persistent. But also because you're not avoiding challenges, you're not giving into procrastination so much, you're not feeling overwhelmed, you have less anxiety and depression as a result. Before we get started, if you enjoy these episodes, you might want to check out more at OptimWork.com. Our website offers unique content, tools, and exercises to help you thrive at work and beyond. We have an in-depth masterclass covering our entire theory of growth, daily recommendations for personalized advice, and a platform to help groups and organizations learn and practice optimal work together. You can get a free trial at OptimWork.com. Now let's start the episode. Hey, this is Sharif here with another episode of the Optimal Work Podcast, joined by Dr. Kevin Majors. Hey, Kevin, welcome back. Hey, Sharif, great to be back. Yeah, well, Kevin, last week we introduced the idea of self-efficacy. I'm not sure if it was the first time we'd ever talked about it, but uh, it was our first deep dive into that concept. And I, I know that you wanted to do a follow-up so that we could help make it very practical and apply it to some different examples and uh, maybe but maybe before diving into those examples and applying it for people who are listening for the first time or for people who just want a refresher, we can kind of just summarize self-efficacy. And I know you've reflected on it a little bit in the past week as well and synthesized some new ideas. So Great, Shreve. That sounds like a good plan to me. The concept of self-efficacy gets at a lot of the things we talk about in optimal work in a slightly different angle. And... Just like we always talk to people about before you start something, try to try to you know be coming up with a real goal to set in it and have some steps and prepare your mind. Well, self-efficacy applies at exactly that same moment. And it's a question. Is your brain predicting that you're going to be successful at attaining this goal or not right before you do something? So you can talk about a general sense of self-efficacy that you carry with you always, but really the, the, the real core concept is a self-efficacy is a prediction your brain makes right before you do something about how likely you are to succeed in attaining the goal. And you can feel it. And so you can, you can think of any action as if it were your next action, and you would get this sense of what is my, what's the what's the likelihood of success that my brain is predicting you could feel daunted and that would generally mean then you'd have lower self-efficacy yeah, or you could feel confident that that would mean that it's higher self-efficacy and so it's a way of thinking about the predictions your brain is making and i like just locating it as a prediction because that shows why forming a strategy to engage that challenging task is the best way you have to improve your self-efficacy and you'll feel it and you'll be different while doing the task so, so uh just to home in on this idea of predictions because like why are these predictions important is part of the reason it seems to me is like um if your brain predicts that you will be and we'll we'll go into this th these examples shortly to make it more concrete for people but if you're facing a challenge and your brain predicts that you'll fail, it's going to more be preparing you to escape or avoid. So you're not, because it thinks you're going to fail, it's not going to give you the full preparation and kind of mental resources that you need to actually engage it fruitfully. But if your brain is predicting that you're going to succeed, it will prepare you. It'll give you the memories, the associations, and it'll actually help you to perform at your best. So that's one reason why it's important to shape your predictions, right? Yeah, so you'll you'll actually have much more resilience while you're engaging the task. But you also have access to higher motivations. That when you have very high self-efficacy, you're more able to shape the why behind what you're doing. Because you're not just trying to survive and get by or like, you know, thinking I'll likely fail. Then it's easy to have the idea of just getting it done. 
So it, shaping self-efficacy has enormous benefits. So for your, in general, your, your ability to be motivated and to be persistent, uh, but also because you're not avoiding challenges, you're not giving into procrastination so much, you're not feeling overwhelmed, you have less anxiety and depression as a result. Mm -hmm. Now, um, okay, then the last clarifying question, I should have asked all these in our last episode, the deep dive into self efficacy but they're all coming up. Uh, so I think when we talk about success and failure and it's your brain, you know, self-efficacy is your brain's prediction of success as opposed to failure, um, that doesn't, I mean, failure in a sense is kind of important in life, right? Because we learn through our mistakes and that sort of thing. So um, if you can see a certain challenge as an opportunity to learn and to grow and to practice, as opposed to only seeing the outcome you want to achieve, then does that change the way that your brain is predicting success by saying, well, maybe I won't actually like literally succeed and achieve the outcome I wanted, but at least I'll learn. So would that be considered self-efficacy? Like I'll get the deeper thing that I want? Absolutely it would. And so you shape your sense of self-efficacy before you start something by widening the context in which you're viewing success. So you can see why a reframe always takes the challenge and widens the context. You can see why reframing has a direct impact on self-efficacy. But it does actually mean also that you'll stay more engaged with the challenge. So you will be much more likely to succeed and much more likely to learn from your failures if you've reframed it in advance. So that you're playing a longer game. So the, the, in a sense, the, you're not going to be feeling so helpless if you can't get a particular outcome because outcomes are not always in our control. But aiming for some way to engage in learning, growth, and practice is basically always in our control. And that's what actually impacts self-efficacy. That and then the steps to make it concrete. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Kevin, I don't, do you have anything else to add to finalize the picture of self-efficacy before we dive into... Just to say that steps also are important for predictions. So one thing is you shift the whole context and now you can have a more positive, likely prediction of how you can succeed in some way. But then you have to make it concrete by laying out at least a few kind of concrete steps that in a way stabilize the reframe, that make it more real. So maybe, maybe now is a great time to go through some examples. Okay, yeah, so our first example is Sarah. Uh, so Sarah, I'm gonna read them. That's okay. Great. So Sarah has been working at her marketing firm for six months and she has faced constant criticism from her boss, Bob, uh, Mr. John. Okay, despite her mm -hmm. efforts, he was never satisfied and, ever, and even demanded last minute changes right before a crucial client pitch. During the presentation, he interrupted her repeatedly, pointed out flaws, which undermined her confidence and complicated the situation. Uh, so for uh, how do you analyze this through the lens of self efficacy Like, does she have low self-efficacy right now? She thinks she's her brain is predicting she's this is a, this is a big failure. Yeah. So if we were to pause, you say he's just delivered some really untimely criticism during a presentation. OK, imagine that we could pause. We could ask Sarah, how likely do you feel that you're going to be able to succeed in this? Now, if success only means an outcome, you know, it, it may be that this, that's kind of slipping away, but maybe not. Because we know that if you have the right process, you, can, you get better outcomes. The process here then would be uh, some way of learning, some kind of growth or practice. So if Sarah could identify one thing she could try that's different than what she's tried before. That's one way of thinking about this. What's one thing new I could do? So she could be trying to practice then a particular skill, let's say. I think skills are often very useful because they're a little bit lower than ideals. They're a little more close to steps. And in this case, I don't know what a skill might be uh, agreeing and redirecting. If she was really good at agreeing and redirecting, this whole challenge might be easier. Maybe that would give her boss the validation that he seems to need, you know, and then, <laughs> but, that, but also not threaten the whole, the whole pitch. And so 
I, I love this formula that I, I use all the time when working with people. Challenge plus X equals easy. And then solve for X. So what can you add to this challenge that would make the challenge easy? That is really a nice way of focusing your attention on a missing ingredient that you can positively supply. Because it's not challenge minus X. It's not like challenge minus Bob equals easy. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so I yeah, just need to get yeah. rid of Bob. Uh, oh, that might be a worthwhile long-term goal. Uh, but but uh, but but in this, in this case, you know, so if if you identify a skill, well, okay, agreeing and redirecting. Um, there's a kind of deeper skill of having Teflon skin, so that you learn to stay focused no matter what, like the naysayers are saying. And the the worse the naysaying is, the more untimely and and unhelpful, then it can actually help you to be a little a little tougher. That's really linked to a skill of assertiveness, just trying to be more assertive even in the moment. That if she showed proper assertiveness, if she was really good at that, if she could get better at it, it would be a win, even if this particular deal doesn't go too well. Before we continue, a brief message. If you're benefiting from these discussions, please take a moment to hit like and subscribe. Doing so helps us to reach more people. So you're not just learning, you're also helping others to discover a path of growth and flourishing. Thanks for your support. If she's in the middle of a presentation, though, it seems like it would be hard to kind of sit down and brainstorm a couple different approaches she could take, especially if she's starting to get like anxious and nervous already from, hey, this yeah. isn't going very well. So um, yeah. so how would you practically advise? So she, as long as she knows that the presentation is coming and that her boss will be there, this may have all been predictable. So now... What we're saying here is not that she should never change jobs or like, you know, it might be in fact that she just uses this as a stimulus to be like widening her job search. So, so reframing doesn't mean sticking with something where it's kind of really, in this case, it's un, um, unjust, like what the, what the boss is doing. Uh, but this, but, but the goal here is just saying for this one instance right now, how can you make the most of it? So identifying a skill then gives you some idea like, oh, Kevin, if I'm just going to be agreeing and redirecting, you know, it might be like when, when he says something, then you go with it, you agree with it, and you try to come back to your, your previous points. So she could have the idea of that when the boss is speaking, make sure she hears him out so she can agree with the main parts. Because usually there's a lot you can agree with. And a lot of times when people present things combatively, it's much easier just to agree with everything you can agree with. And I think that can be like a superpower. She might have to also learn how to practice reframing her own adrenaline so that she can use it and, and learn to welcome it. And if the boss is being negative, that's just going to mean a little more adrenaline to use. So if she can, you know, then come up with like particular steps, they might not be sequential, but just some things of asking more questions, you know, to, to make sure she understands the point when there's some kind of criticism. Um, inviting the boss to like explain the point more fully so it looks like you're on the same team uh, or simply hearing and agreeing and then going back to your original point. There might be things that she looks to practice concretely. So how is uh, the boss's self-efficacy here in this situation? Impossible to say. No, I'm just that's not, that's not, <laughs> not what we're going for. Sorry. I just had to throw a curveball <laughs> at you. Uh, yes. The goal here is, you know, that, that is, uh, it might be that the boss has to be aiming more for humility and for yeah. <laughs> generosity and for, I don't know, wisdom of how do you yeah. like, help someone to, because yeah, it yeah. sounds like it's very foolish. Yeah. Yeah. It does uh, help, I think, help see that, hey, it would be nice if your colleagues practiced optimal work as well. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> you, people have to own the growth even when someone else's behavior is beyond the pale, it's still good for us to learn to own the growth that the situation is affording. Take it entirely for yourself. How can I use this to get stronger? How can I use this to get better? So I think that's a kind of healthy selfishness to own a challenge so that you can grow the most because that will eventually be the thing that allows you to serve the clients the most. Just like using these kind of things to to hone more in on how to serve the client 
and making sure you're providing the best service. So it's not about you, but it's more about what they need and giving them what they need to hear. So it could be that what the boss is saying helps you to arrive with the client at an even better solution. So just to stay positive about it is a, is a great skill. Yeah. Actually, that kind of reminds me because I think we talked about self-efficacy, you know, a number of years ago. And at that time, there was a definition that was floating around of like a confidence in one's ability to grow and change, I think was mm -hmm. kind yeah. of the definition. And now you're, it's, if you're saying, okay, self-efficacy is it's like your brain's prediction that you will succeed. And if you have this growth mm -hmm. mindset and success is about growth, it's your brain's prediction that this situation will actually help you to grow. So it's that you can actually yes. engage the challenge fruitfully. So, so growth mindset plus, you know, like make self-efficacy, you know, all about, hey, I can grow in this situation. So it's- Absolutely, because it's, it's changing the definition of success, taking it from something outside of your control, a given outcome, to something that is within your control that in the long run, at least will yield much better outcomes. That's great. I'm I'm all yeah. on board with that. Before what you what we gave was my that was my definition of self efficacy as far as I remember. It's uh -huh. oh about confidence in one's ability to change. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and also it is the prediction is what we, what you experience as confidence. So and so, but you can grow your confidence. Growing confidence really means growing self efficacy in a given task, and you do that by shaping the goal and shaping the steps. And it works very reliably. That's, Kevin, do you want to do the next uh, next example? Let's do another one, yeah. Okay, so this one is about Ethan, uh, a college sophomore who is struggling with his German studies and feels overwhelmed by the language's complex grammar and vocabulary. Uh, and the really long words, I suppose. Uh, with his midterm approach- Verbs at the end. Yeah, it's complicated. Uh, with his midterm approaching, his anxiety intensified, worrying about potential failure and disappointing his parents even. Uh, despite being a, di a diligent student, Ethan doubted his ability to master German, which transformed what was once an exciting challenge into a source of stress and self-doubt. Okay. So the challenge here is mastering German, pretty clear. And I guess it's within like, say, a few days before, yeah. before the midterm. Good luck with that. So again, we have the idea that challenge plus X equals easy. What can he add to this equation to make it easy? And then you solve for X. Um, just from like learning theory, we, we know that if you're thinking of a skill, uh, active painful recall is the best way to learn anything. That it has to hurt to recall things. And so you quiz yourself. So you're making sure you never do any kind of uh, passive reading and expect that to do anything, like just rereading your notes, rereading the textbook, as much as you can. You try to make it active, painful recall. And then you do it again and again and again until it gets easier and easier. And then you start spacing it a bit. But he doesn't have a whole lot of time for spacing. But it's still... So there might be another skill, uh, which is prioritizing. So just break down, this is actually the ideal of order, but you set priorities, like a, an order of priority. You break it down into smaller parts so that you tackle the most important first or your biggest deficit area. You tackle that first and then you go to the next one and then to the next one. And you might go back to the first one with this active painful recall. Having the sense that la learning a language is not about a trait, it's, it's a winnable game. You just have to learn to play the game. And the game is getting the language into your memory. So seeing it like that, that this is something that you can win at if you practice the right skill sets, that makes it, it changes your whole prediction. So it's not just predicting that it's going to be a grind until you force yourself across the finish line of the midterm. Because that, that negative prediction will likely be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, because if you expect it to be a grind, you're not innovating. You're not solving for X to find out what would make this easier. You're not practicing skills. And for anything you want to learn, you can always be. It's not that hard to find what is a skill that would make this easier? Or what's a skill that people who are um, 
much better at this than me? What do they seem to have? You can talk to other people. So actually, this raises a question of what is kind of more of like a neuroscience memory question. It's not mm -hmm. exactly core optimal work, but um, we said earlier that if you have self-efficacy for a given situation and that helps your brain kind of prepare itself for you to perform at your best. Now, mm -hmm. in the context of language learning, it seems like one thing that your brain needs to do is, as you pointed out, like kind of prepare its memory to store things in there, mm -hmm. short term, long term. I, I don't know. Um, so, what does self effic or does a lack of self efficacy, like a prediction that you're going to fail, impact? Do you know if it has any impact on like memory storage and that that whole process? Well, we know that if people have high self efficacy. Uh, in their academic studies, they have much higher recall and performance. But it's one of these things where predicting success makes it more likely and predicting failure makes it more likely. So really what we're telling, when we talk about self-efficacy, we're just asking people to tune in right before they start something and to check what's the prediction. You can feel it because self-efficacy is a felt sense that your brain is predicting that you'll succeed at this. And if you can tell it, and if it is, then maybe business as usual will work. Although I still think you'll always benefit from identifying a skill or ideal that you're gonna to try to, to sharpen th through this activity. That only raises it. And I like to aim for skills in general because once you, like say in this case with the German, if you talk about active painful recall and prioritization, well, okay, those are going to be um, part of living order, which is a higher ideal. Uh, it could be also that uh, even intensity, that if he could divide his day into golden hours and breaks, he's going to aid the process of active painful recall and you know much, much, much more than if he tries to go on marathons. So... There are things he can do in how he structures his day to protect intensity, to make sure that when he's doing this work, his, his, he's a near 100% efficiency. Hey, that's great. Okay, that, Kevin, that, uh, I think we have time for one more example. Right. And I, I know we have these laid out, but you're, everything you've said so far has gotten me to think of another example. Go for it. It's, it's a personal example. Um, so when you said that before you start work, it's good to check your prediction. And mm -hmm. one thing I was thinking about was, so I'm working on this kind of large uh, software engineering, you know, like uh, website feature task. And it's a little bit repetitive. I find it a little bit cumbersome and boring because it's not like interesting. There aren't interesting problems along the way. It's kind of like, okay, you just have to do this and then do this and then do this. So... Well, and when, one thing I realized is that when I sit down to start, I think I have the prediction that I'm going to give in to a distraction. So uh, that's like, I'm going to fail. Um, and mm -hmm. so, okay, so is that a lack of self-efficacy? It could be that with regard to distractions there, you could say yeah. it's a kind of lack of self-efficacy if you're predicting that you'll fail. So that prediction is like a frozen snapshot of, of the task. It's not a complete picture of the task, nor is it a complete picture of what you're capable of in the task, but you can feel it right before you start. And it could color your experience of the task right before you start it. So it might be that for you then, the main challenge is maintaining intensity or constancy throughout the length of the task. So then you could be asking yourself, okay, if that's the challenge, then challenge plus X equals easy. What would you do? What would you add to this to make it easier? I would, maybe I would try to find a way to make it more interesting. That's kind of what, cause I'm thinking, oh, this tab, you know, it's kind of repetitive and boring. So if I could find a way to make it more interesting or find like, actually it's almost like there isn't a check or the challenge is that it's, there's no challenge. It's just kind of doing that, which I know I can do. Um, so I need to find a way to kind of make it more difficult or think of like an, a more innovative or creative way to accomplish the task. 
if if the task itself isn't a challenge, then it might be that the motive is the challenge. What would it look like to raise your motive for why you're doing this? Um, what would it look like to have like a greater um, to bring a greater sense of love and service to this task? Um, what e even just say? a greater sense of interior silence. I think interior silence is in say menial things or things that don't require like, they're just easy for you. Uh, practice doing this thing mindfully in total silence opens up a whole new, um, a feeling of like, there's like an internal dimension now to the task that's opened up. That the task becomes more meditative or contemplative. So, and just by seeking to maintain this interior silence, you can find that you can maintain intensity much more easily all through the task. So when you detect thoughts coming, that's like a little microcosm of distraction. You just detect it, let go of it, and then re-anchor yourself on the task itself. But the goal is to maintain this interior silence all the way through it. I think silence is like how silence makes every task spiritual in some way. Because there's a core of us much deeper than our psychological structures. And that core is much more akin to a silent awareness. You know, and, and so I think that we get more inspiration even when we are more habitually tapped into that. So you can look forward to that task as a way of tapping into this deeper spiritual core. Okay. All right. I'm on it. I got to go do that right now, actually. So we got to wrap up. <laughs> Great. I would still have a couple of steps, though. <laughs> I'm motiv I motivated to get started. Set a perimeter before you <laughs> yeah, close yeah, out yeah. all browser windows that you don't need. Exactly. Set a stop time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Those are those are the concrete steps that uh, yes. will make it easier as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. And the steps of the task to lay them exactly. out. Exactly. Lay out the steps. Yeah. If they might be, I don't know, I don't know what the task is like, but. If the task allows for distinct 10 to 15 minute steps, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Right. Per awesome. Kevin, I, th I think that's it for today. You've, you've helped me and I think all everyone listening as well or watching. All right, Shreve. Well, thanks for the, the this chance to go through these uh, important concepts again. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. We'll be back next week. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoyed our conversation and you're looking for more in-depth guidance, check out OptimWork.com our unique platform that delivers content, tools, and exercises to help you thrive at work and beyond.